At first glance, they lead entirely normal lives. But in reality, they are women killers, men who murder women. In the United States, Ted Bundy, a charming single man who buries his victims in the woods. I'll plead not guilty right now. In South Africa, Moses Sitola. He promises women jobs and success and kills them. This whole area here was scattered with bodies. And in Canada, Robert Picton. At his farm, he throws wild parties with a deadly climax. They found thousands and thousands of DNA, human DNA. And there are still more women killers. Their deeds are among the greatest crimes of all time. in the northwestern United States, a beloved vacation destination for families from nearby Seattle. But in the summer of 1982, the idyllic river transforms into a grave. While on a bicycle ride, two children find a strangled girl under the bridge. She is just 16 years old. Sue Peters is one of the lead detectives on the Green River case. She realizes rather quickly that all this is just the beginning of something bigger. As my partner and I were walking along the shoreline, heading down towards the river along this bank, we discovered another female's body deep in the brush. Again, a 16-year-old girl. She's been missing for three days. And then Detective Peters finds even more female corpses. Finding three bodies in one day made us realize that we had a very serious problem and probably a serial killer on our hands in our local area. The bodies. All are of runaways or prostitutes. No one suspects that a seemingly harmless family man is behind the murders. His name, Gary Ridgway and he has a signature all his own. The murders of a serial killer will often get special components to them that are unique to that case. In his victims, Ridgway put rocks into their vaginas, presumably in a way to sort of keep someone else out for his later desires, his later attempts, his later commissions of necrophilia. Sue Peters still suspects none of this. First, search parties comb the entire river basin. They discover the blouse of one of the victims and sperm residue, which they freeze. Today, helpful pieces of evidence, but in the mid-1980s, the police have no chance of catching the culprit this way. The police in those early times didn't have a technique for linking individuals so certainly. Remember, going back to that time frame, our ability of actually collecting and analyzing trace amounts of evidence was, um, you know, didn't really exist. A half year and seven female corpses later, the inhabitants in and around Seattle are frightened. Who will be the next victim? For the time being, there's only one thing Sue Peters and her colleagues can do. Keep a broad area along the river's course under surveillance. But the killer reacts and chooses a new scene for his crimes. The detectives find the next body 20 kilometers away from the river. The new strategy was that he drove out to the outskirts of King County and dumped the bodies of the victims in the forested area like this. The murderer is careful in choosing the locations where he leaves the bodies. The corpses are supposed to remain undiscovered for several days. Only this way can he indulge his sick impulses. 
he would revisit crime scenes just to go back and have sex with his victims again. It could have been for different reasons. On the one hand, it could have been because he doesn't want to yet go out and find a new victim, so it's a second choice substitute to relive the event. Or he could have had some general sexual preference for engaging with sexual behavior with, with deceased people. The killer is willing to drive further and further. The chance of catching him in the act fades. Just about all the victims were prostitutes. So Detective Sue Peters and her team search for suspects along Pacific Highway South, Seattle's street walking scene in the 80s. They are very easy to be targeted because of that lifestyle that they're involved in. They were available on the highway that he went up and down in his truck. He would see them there, he knew they were there, and once they were off the street, he knew that he had them secure. The number of victims continues to rise. Pressure on the detectives mounts. But Ridgway's cover is good. So often, like many serial killers, the reason that they're successful is that they blend into society, much like Gary Ridgway did. He was a man who was a church-going family man who had some difficulties in his private life, but held down a job and was, to all intents and purposes, quite normal. After a few months, the police work with the street walkers pays off. A pimp reports the prostitute Marley Marva missing. She's 18 years old. She had gotten in a pickup truck and was never seen again. The owner of the truck, Gary Ridgway. For the first time, the Green River killer comes to the attention of Sue Peters. Mr. Ridgway told the police that he was uninvolved in the incident and did not pick up any girl on the highway. Remember, the officer uh, knew Gary Ridgway from school. So it didn't do much. Shortly thereafter, the police form the Green River Task Force. They discover a shoe print, size 11, and another remote crime scene. The killer must know the area. A few months later, Ridgway again comes to the attention of police. He offers an undercover policewoman money for sex. There's no evidence that he's also the killer, but the noose is tightening around his neck. Gary Ridgway ended up picking up another girl that he was going to date. And they went to a wooded area. The girl ended up biting his privates, and they got into a scuffle, and she was able to get away. Detectives question Ridgway, but he stays as cool as ice, and even insists on taking a lie detector test. A polygraph test is a test for certain physiological reactions. If you don't have any guilt, you're not going to get the increase in your heart rate or your breathing that would be associated with normal guilt. Sue Peters' task force puts Ridgway at the top of their list of suspects, but she can't prove anything. This was Gary Ridgway's house back in the 1980s time period, and he would actually bring women back here that he was dating and ended up murdering them there. Then, two years and about 30 bodies later, the series of murders seems to stop. Sue Peters and her team find a few more dead women, but none who have been killed recently. The police search Ridgway's house in 1987. They even call in the FBI, but the killer leads an inconspicuous life. He was in our radar several times, but there wasn't enough evidence to arrest him. In the following years, detectives find 10 more bodies, but no evidence. Until a brand new method of investigation changes everything. DNA analysis. The analysis of DNA is now an incredibly powerful tool for the police. Not just for modern cases, but for cold cases. For cases where there is material still left in unsolved crimes. This gives investigators a new chance. They compare Ridgway's saliva sample with old pieces of evidence. A match. They arrest him in the parking lot where he works. At first, Ridgway seems to admit to the murders. 
Are you presently under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or medications? No. How do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder for the death of Alma A. Smith? Guilty. But he only admits to six murders. Ridgeway wants to avoid the death penalty. Only when the police guarantee this does he speak. The killer shows no remorse whatsoever for the women he has killed. When you have so many victims like Ridgeway, I think it's impossible not to argue that there was a level of objectification going on here, where he was seeing the woman, the victims, as objects, as objects specifically for his sexual desire, for his sexual purposes, and nothing else. He might even enjoy the fact that he gets the attention from a trial, because now he's again the center stage. He gets to see the pictures of what he's done. He gets to hear about the suffering of his victims. And that, again, might be a secondary pleasure for him to go through that process also. Investigators accept the deal, and Gary Ridgway admits to more murders. Once he refers to 48 victims, once to 71. I believe most definitely there still are some bodies in the forest. There have been a lot of women that are still missing in King County, and their remains have never been recovered. Ultimately, the court convicts Gary Ridgway for the murder of 49 women. Thanks to his deal, the killer has managed to avoid the death penalty. But the Green River killer will remain behind bars for the rest of his life. For Sue Peters, this sentence is the end of a 20-year chase. It was a relief to me and knowing that Gary Ridgway would never hurt any of the ladies in our community again. For people around Seattle, a new chapter in life begins. A life without fear of Gary Ridgway. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. But there are more of them, women killers. Generally, they cause widespread fear and panic for years. And their acts are among the worst crimes of all time. My name is Ted Bunny. South Africa, Johannesburg. 1995, people are in an uproar. The reason? 40 rapes and 38 murders in only one year. This whole area here was scattered with bodies. And it's a place you won't forget in your life. The victims, all young women. What some victims would do is allow them to pass out and then stop strangling them. So they would revive by themselves and then continue to strangle them. Their killer, Moses Sitole. I just say that fuck. How do investigators catch the brutal woman killer? Atteridgeville, a township north of Johannesburg. The inhabitants are largely black African and poor. In July 1994, Captain Vinol Vinhula is called to a nearby field. What he sees here is truly shocking even for an experienced investigator. We found a female deceased, uh, dead by manual strangulation. Uh, we also saw that her pants were taken off, uh, thinking that most probably she was raped as well. It saddens one. A person, when you find a body, uh, not knowing why that person was killed, the young woman is the first victim of the 30-year-old killer, Moses Sitole. And he's just begun. From now on, investigators find a new victim every month. All of them female, black African, and between 19 and 30 years of age. Strangulation is, is seen to be the most common method, at least in South Africa. It's a very personal and very up-close way of killing the victims. The overarching goal for most of these guys is the issue of controlling and, and uh, power for them. 
controlling their victims, controlling their lives, controlling their destinies. And I think that was the case with Satole, because what some victims he would do is allow them to pass out and then stop strangling them. So they would revive by themselves and then continue to strangle them. Each woman dies according to the exact same pattern. That indicated to us that a serial killer was busy in this area and we had to get hold of him and apprehend him as quick as possible before more victims was part of his crime. Investigators have an initial profile. They know that the killer strangles the women and his victims are poor. They search for more evidence in the victim's milieu, but no one has noticed anything. For the police investigation, it must be very frustrating to know there is a killer, to have so much information, but not to be able to identify the one person. And a fresh victim, sad as it may be, can often give you that little piece of information that's going to lead you to actually solving the case. But the police do not want it to come to that. The mid-1990s are a boom period in South Africa. Many unemployed women move from the town into the city in order to earn money. From family members, Captain Vin Hula knows that the women always go missing during the day, mostly in busy places. Investigators suspect that the killer offers the women a job, thus luring them into his trap. He was very charming. He was a very good smooth talker, um, very believable, quite a good looking guy. So most people that he approached didn't sense him as a threat. The women never come back. They believed in him because of their innocence. And that's the reason why they followed him. And they got killed. It's terrible. It's, it's gruesome. It's not the way that anybody wants to die. A little later, more murdered women in nearby Cleveland. First, it was one body every month. Now, the killer strikes more often. First, every two weeks. Then every week. And soon, two times a week. All serial killers fantasize about the perfect murder, the murder that fulfills all of their fantasies. But if you don't achieve your perfect murder, then there's a desire to do it again. By July 1995, one year after the first murder, Moses Sitola has strangled 18 young women to death. The police decide to go public with this story, and indeed, Shortly thereafter comes the crucial call. After the murders in Alteridgeville and Cleveland, the civilian reports several bodies in Boxburg. Sitol gets the name, the ABC killer. In September 1995, Captain Vin Hula arrives at the worst crime scene of the investigation so far, only 20 kilometers away from Johannesburg. This whole area here was scattered with bodies. And it's a place you won't forget in your life. It lets you feel like crying for somebody that lost their, 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 their lives. And then believing in other people, in a person, for giving a job, or promising a job to assist to get a job, and then end up dead. Vin Hula finds the bodies of 14 women, all strangled. So it is very, very difficult. A lot of pressure was on. And Nelson Mandela himself came to one of the townships to ask the people in the township to help the police to solve the crime. The black African community stages increasingly frequent protests and demands that the murders get finally solved. Captain Vin Hula wants justice for the people. And indeed, he finds a crucial piece of evidence when researching one of the victims. 
Trifina is a social worker in the Kids Haven Youth Centre and mentions a job offer the day before. A friend of one of the deceased ladies uh, were found here. We interviewed the lady and she provided us with the name of Moses Itole. Uh, we managed to get a photo of him and through his records we, to identify him. The photo of Moses Sitoli appears in the press nationwide. The police search intensively and try to find out more about the alleged killer. Moses Sitoli grew up the fourth child in a poor family. As a young boy, he is abused by his mother and his stepsister. Traumatizing experiences which the woman killer never forgets, as he himself later says. And I thought to myself, fuck, does this woman know what she's doing in my heart? Or oh, in my mind? She's making me crazy. When his father dies, Moses Sitole is sent to a juvenile home. Twice he runs away and goes back to his own house. But no one wants him there anymore. When a man is head, it's true head. They can do anything. For Moses Sitoli, he had a very uh, difficult childhood. He had a very domineering mother. He felt that women, from, literally from birth, had rejected him, punished him. He, had, he says there was a false allegation and conviction for rape. And it was then that he decided, I'm going to go out and rape and murder woman. The young man must make it on his own, in a time in which violence reigns on the streets. Sitole quickly notices that many women find him attractive. When I talk to you, she must think I'm quiet. I'm OK, I'm handsome, but, but inside, as I say, I was baby. Myself, I'll show him. Summer 1995. After over a year of killing, Sitole gets overconfident. He calls a newspaper and brags about the murders. I think clearly for Moses Sitole that the issue of being known for these crimes, it increases his self-worth in his own eyes. But the killer makes a crucial mistake. He gives away information about his location during the telephone call. Some of my black members were placed at a factory to have obs observation for him. Uh, we as whites were further away because if he see us as whites, he would have been suspicious. He did pitch. Uh, my members did approach him. When he saw them, he started running away. They followed him. Uh, he turned around, took out a machete and started. Uh, axing to them, uh, then he got shot in the stomach, uh, arrested, and then transported to hospital. It was the best day of our lives. Uh, satisfactory, we know we have him. Uh, no more murders can take place anymore. He was inside. Sitoli is finally in custody. He is indicted five days after his arrest. The trial lasts one year. Little by little, peace is restored to the population, even though no one knows how many women the killer truly has on his conscience. I would say the total lot is counted at the present moment of 38. It's not the right total. It's a good lesson for ladies around this country, in Africa. And take note and be serious with life. So you should have taught them a good lesson. Yeah, it is. Very good. On October the 21st, 1996, the court finds Moses Sitole guilty of 38 murders and 40 rapes, sentencing him to 2,410 years in prison. For Captain Vinhula, it is the end of a chase that lasted much too long, but was ultimately successful and gives the relatives at least some satisfaction. But there are also women killers who are active over a period of many years. 
Their deeds are among the worst crimes of all time. I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Vancouver. A man kills dozens of women over six years. It's the largest criminal investigation in Canada's history. Robert Picton, the butcher of Canada. The farm becomes a horror show. They found thousands and thousands of DNA, human DNA. Detective Lorimer Shenher devotes his entire career to hunting the killer. My first concern was, you know, did we have, was he digging, you know, underground bunkers? Was he keeping women alive down there? A case that rocks Canada to the core, and even today has not lost its grip. How could it all happen? Vancouver, 1998. Detective Laurie Machenhur has only recently begun working in the homicide division. His assignment is to find women who have been reported missing. So it was my second day on the job um, investigating Vancouver's missing women, and I got a tip, which was a call to Crime Stoppers, and it said that a man named Robert Picton, who lived on a farm, could be responsible for the missing women. So right away I was excited, and I thought, this, this is the kind of tip that I'm looking for. The name Robert Picton, a first lead. But there are hundreds of Pictons around Vancouver. So Detective Laurie Machenhur tries to find out more about the victims. I wanted to find out, first of all, how many women we were actually dealing with and were, we, were there women missing that we weren't aware of. And I also made contact with all of the, um, the family members on, on each file who, were, who had reported them missing. What Shenher discovers is striking. 17 of the missing women come from the city's red light district and drug neighborhood, the first lead. While Detective Shenher searches for clues, more and more women fall into the hands of Robert Picton. The farmer regularly engages prostitutes. His tastes are extreme and he knows that prostitutes are easy prey. They weren't really concerned with this group of the population. They may have noticed it, but it was another prostitute. She probably wasn't murdered. She's just moved on to some other place. But Detective Laurie Machin here believes that there is more behind the disappearances. You know, it was really difficult to get people to believe that something sinister might have happened to them. I suspected strongly it was a serial killer for the, for the number one reason we weren't finding any bodies. We were not finding bodies. The detective tries to prove that a woman killer is at work. But even Detective Shen here doesn't really know what Picton does exactly. On a regular basis, the farmer takes the prostitutes home with him. He throws wild parties at his pig farm that go to dawn. Hardly any of the girls leave the place alive. Meanwhile, Detective Laurie Machen here searches for evidence to support his theory. He wants to locate the anonymous caller. And he's successful. Shen here manages to trace the number. After weeks of convincing, the man, who calls himself Bill Hiscox, agrees to meet at a Starbucks. We took him to a Starbucks, uh, went in, I went in and got a coffee, and we sat in the car uh, and talked. He didn't want to be seen with the police. And he told that he had a friend who'd seen uh, bloody clothing in bags in the Picton trailer and women's ID, uh, and that this woman thought that this, uh, this stuff belonged to potentially some of the missing women from Vancouver. The informant is scared and disappears again right away. 
but his information leads Shen He to a pig farm in Port Coquitlam. It belongs to the biggest and richest farmer in the region, Robert Picton, a man with powerful friends. I drove around the property on the outside to have a look around, and uh, it was really obvious to me that, that it was not a very welcoming place. And, you know, when I half expected some guy to come out with a, with a shotgun and rack the shotgun at me or something, uh, it was really inhospitable. Shen He quickly discovers that Picton's home is more than your average farm. Once a week, the farmer throws very special parties, so-called Piggy Palace Good Times parties. He was able to buy friendship with drugs and with alcohol. And all of the, these things combined together to make him feel a much better person. At Picton's farm, government officials party together with Hell's Angels and prostitutes. There were two types of parties. There were the sort of above board community parties where you would see local politicians, police officers, other people in government, uh, but there were also sex parties and uh, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, and um, you know, it's, uh, I think a lot of times the things that happened at those parties weren't necessarily things that, uh, that everybody was consenting to. Shen Hair is certain. The powerful party guests are the reason that no one is talking. Even his requests for a search warrant are rejected again and again. Trying to find somebody who was willing to talk and go on the record. You know, there were even people who worked for the RCMP who knew various people who were coming to these parties, but they didn't want to talk about it. The detective tries to find out more about the mysterious farmer, who seems to be protected from on high. Robert Picton is the kind of person who you would describe as a social outcast. He was uh, made fun of at school, and he lived on a farm with, with pigs, and his best friends were alleged to be the, the animals. The farm has been in the Picton family for generations. As a child, Robert Picton already slaughtered and butchered pigs regularly. His one real skill, the thing that he actually excelled in, was butchering animals. Early on, the future killer learns from his mother. Human beings are only animals. His mother was a, a very dominant, tyrannical lady who clearly was the prime force in his childhood. When Picton's mother dies, the Butcher of Canada gives free rein to his impulses. The satisfaction and the sense of control that he was missing, he was getting this from his interaction with prostitutes and his, his killing of prostitutes. It was really a win-win situation. One, he gets these victims, he gets to enjoy them, kill them, rape them, engage with them, and then when he's done, he doesn't have to worry about, okay, now what do I do with the body? I have to transport it someplace and dump it. Right here, he had a ready-made way to get rid of the victims. Picton feeds the bodies to his pigs. A story so incredible that no one is willing to believe it. Meanwhile, 30 women from around Vancouver have gone missing. Detective Shen here despairs, has nightmares, can't let go. Then the case is taken away from him. When my superiors made the decision to pass the file on, um, I really felt two different ways. I felt, on the one hand, um, I felt like a failure. Because I was so burnt out and I'd been wearing so many hats, I felt there was a possibility I'd made mistakes and that I'd missed things. And I felt maybe somebody who came in with fresh eyes would, might see th something that I didn't see. But little happens. For a whole year, women continue to go missing until a civilian reports something suspicious and encounters a policeman who knows nothing at all about Picton's connections. A guy driving a truck had been out to his farm, had seen many weapons at the farm and mentioned this to the police. And the police then decided that they would go and have a look and see what was going on at the farm. When they finally do focus on him, the, the farm becomes a horror show. Police find not only non-registered weapons, but also an asthma inhaler, 
bearing the name of one of the missing women. A decisive turn. For an entire year, officials search the property, dig the whole thing up. You know, in this dirty, sloppy, messy, stinky pig farm, you're now trying to find literally 100 plus victims within that. Very, very difficult task. They found thousands and thousands of DNA, human DNA. For Lorimer Shen here, this is ultimately a kind of success. But mostly, it is just a punch in the gut. If we could have searched this area when we first got the Lynn Ellingson tip, uh, there's no question in my mind we would have saved between 13 and 17 women. Even today, it's not entirely clear how many women Robert Pipton lured to his farm and killed. He himself said that his goal was the big 5-0, 50 murders. The sentence comes five years later, life in prison for only six proven murders. For Detective Shen Hare, a frustrating sentence that has come far too late. What small bit of vindication I felt, uh, you know, was in, in being right, because I was right and I knew all along that it was him, um, it was completely overshadowed by by that sense of devastation. And, uh, you know, it's hard to explain a feel, what it feels like to, to say I was in shock for something that I expected every day was going to happen. Picton is finally behind bars. But after this case, Detective Shen Hare loses his faith in justice, and he quits. In the United States, arguably the worst woman killer of all commits his monstrous deeds. Ted Bundy. I'll plead not guilty right now. For a long time, even one of America's top investigators cannot stop him. Well, I believe he didn't have a conscience about what he was doing. A charming killer who slays his victims and buries them in the woods. Bundy's smile means death for more than 30 women. Robert, my name is Ted Bundy. How do investigators manage to catch this woman killer? Summer 1974. At Sammamish Lake, near Seattle, people are enjoying the weekend. One of them, an attractive, friendly man with his arm in a sling, Ted Bundy. A classic psychopath is someone who is quite intelligent, who is charming, who has easy access to victims. Luring the unsuspecting victim is just as much about power and control as is your physical domination while you're busy assaulting and killing that person. Ted Bundy asks young women for help with his boat and lures them to the river bank. And he beats the girls to death. Detective Robert Keppel is one of the most famous investigators in the U.S. The hunt for Ted Bundy marks his life to this day. He appeared to be the good-looking guy that everybody's girlfriend would want to date. And some of the women that he chose were just outstanding women. Bundy strikes twice on this day. First, he carries off 23-year-old Janice Ann Ott, and then he flirts with 19-year-old Denise Marie Naslund. And then, boom, he would change that personality like a chameleon. He would be the very nice, accommodating, friendly, good-looking guy, and then all of a sudden he would turn into this monster. For Bundy, it's about more than just killing was a man who liked to have sex with dead bodies. So he was always talking about that when I met with him. The three times that I've interviewed him, he was very comfortable in talking about necrophilia. It could be a way that he doesn't have to go out and get a new victim yet. He still prolongs the pleasure from that particular victim, although in a very gruesome manner. These are all indicative of a person who does not feel at all for what this person or what used to be a person uh, might, have, might have gone through. The families are desperate and report both girls missing. 
Two months later, a hunter finds human bones in the mountains, only a few kilometers away from Samamish Lake. Robert Keppel's hunt for Ted Bundy begins here. We were there for approximately a week collecting bones that we found throughout the hillside. Well, we expanded our team from two of us to seven. We had one skull that we found where there were skull fractures. So we knew what happened to that lady. Keppel immediately thinks of the missing girls Ott and Naslund. But the bones alone don't bring him any further. This was in the 70s. We, we weren't really engaged in that kind of forensic analysis. There wasn't any type of DNA analysis. We weren't even aware of DNA analysis. After days of searching, a first success. Kippel's team finds tufts of hair. The one with the head damage had black hair, and there was blonde hair there along an animal trail. And what we did was get samples of their hair from their room, from their hairbrushes, from their bathrooms. And the blonde hair belonged to Janice Ott. Who is the killer? The clue leads Detective Keppel to Seattle University. Female students have been disappearing here recently. Almost all of them long-haired and attractive. A lot of the victims that he selected later on matched basically physically the description of this girlfriend that dumped him. He was trying to live out this interaction between him and his ex-girlfriend, but in a way where he was in charge. He decided when it ended, and he decided the ultimate outcome. Initially, the investigation comes to nothing. Then Robert Keppel and his team find the remains of 18-year-old Susan Rancourt. Friends at the university tell of a young man on campus with his arm in a sling who approaches women. Panic quickly grips college campuses. Security staff guard the students. And then the nightmare appears to be over. No more mysterious man with his arm in a sling. No more missing women. Seattle seems safe again. But Ted Bundy doesn't stop. He chooses a new hunting ground. Soon there are murders in the states of Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado. He moved state, he moved to a place where he was unknown and began again in the same manner. Really, his victim selection type should have been something that jurisdictions keyed in on. But agencies in Washington didn't know what agencies in Utah were doing. 24 murders later, Bundy finally gets tripped up in a vehicle inspection. The policeman knows his description and arrests him. Ted Bundy, you know, he, he studied at university for a period. He was very good looking, very well spoken. People just didn't expect that this could be the guy committing these very brutal acts. And the evidence is thin. No clues, either at the university or in his former student residence. Nevertheless, the court indicts Bundy for murder. He decides to represent himself. He was not a lawyer. He had not graduated from university in law school at all. He took law classes, that's all. Bundy flees before the verdict is rendered. He's then quickly caught and breaks out again. For Detective Robert Keppel, it's a bitter setback. I was just amazed that they would allow him to escape twice. First time was one thing, but the second time no excuse for it. But that was Colorado authorities. They weren't that smart. And the woman killer makes it to Florida. There he kills the students Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman and attacks five girls with a wooden bludgeon. He needed to kill someone, but he didn't have the time to plan his route. And so it had to be a blitz attack to achieve what he wanted. In Seattle, 
Robert Keppel reads in the newspaper about the murders in Florida, and he's sure it must be Bundy. I did call him and reminded them of who he was. But the problem was they didn't care. Thanks for the information and hung up the phone. Two weeks later, Bundy kills a child for the first time. A 12-year-old girl, I think for him, was, was at a point when his world essentially was falling apart. He wasn't the Ted Bundy, the offending Ted Bundy from earlier in his career. Bundy gets sloppy. Again, he's stopped by police and is arrested. Represent yourself, or you're going to get another attorney. I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. But there's still no solid evidence. The case is entirely circumstantial. The killer is self assured. Mr. Bundy? He told me that you told him that you were going to get me. He said he was going to get me, okay? You've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. Let's read it. Let's go. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged, indictment, two counts burglary in the, uh, two counts murder in the first degree, three counts attempted murder in the first degree. I'll plead not guilty right now. The law student believes he can overwhelm the court and the jury with his charm. Robert, my name's Ted Bundy. To commit a crime and then to believe that you're the best person, you're the most qualified person to defend yourself, that's a level of arrogance that goes far beyond what most people would be willing to accept. But for a psychopathic narcissist, of course you are your first choice. It's Bundy's final decision. The court sentences him to death by electric chair. Before his execution, Bundy tries to stall by promising to confess more murders. Detective Robert Keppel sets off immediately for Florida. Well, he wasn't in very good shape. He was sweating. He was out of breath. He had a lot of worry in his mind. He did not want to talk about anything other than what he wanted to talk about. He was always playing a game. He was always fishing and wanting to get some advantage. And the decision was that this was Ted Bundy playing games. And so they said, no, thank you. You're to be executed. Ultimately, Bundy confesses to 30 murders. Investigators believe it was twice as many. After nine years on death row, the sentence is finally carried out. The terror that Bundy spread is definitely over. And women are once again safe from the man who was arguably the USA's worst killer. Women killers. They've all murdered dozens of women brutally. And paid for it. Three of them are now spending life behind bars. And Ted Bundy is finally history.